Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for showing up so bright and early. So if I've seen it as my task here to give a sort of a brief overview into fMRI acquisition. It's kind of basic, probably all we can do in 20 minutes, but I'll talk about some of the artifacts um, and so forth. Um, so I should reveal I've got my fingers in this little company here. And uh, what I'll be doing, I'll just give a few slides on basic bolt signal and then go through a bunch of fMRI sequences and considerations we have available and then talk about the parameter choices which ultimately relate to the artifacts to get an artifact management. Um, just to sort of start off with a fun fact, there's this Italian guy more than 100 years ago who did the first sort of functional experiment um, by putting someone on the balance here um, and getting them a task to do and he found that the blood flow in would increase to such an extent that the weight would actually shift that the head would tip downwards. And I find that quite fun because basically this is still the same sort of uh, type of acquisition we do today, but we do the imaging with MRI instead. Now, um, so the bolt signal basically comes from the fact that we have neuronal activation going on when we use our brain, which by some mechanism that I'm not going to talk about here leads to um, um, an oxygen uptake, um, which will free up, uh, well, take up oxygen and then we'll get more uh, oxy, uh, hemoglobin. Now, this is not the only thing that happens. So there's actually three things going on during neuronal activation. So that's the CMRO2 increase. On the one hand, that'll basically the ox oxygen uptake, but there is a, a blood flow increase and a blood volume increase as well. And it turns out that the dominant effect is the blood flow increase, so that, that the, the, the net effect will actually be a reduction in the oxyhemoglobin, contrary as to what you might, might expect from the fact that we actually consume oxygen. Um, so we have a washout of the oxyhemoglobin, which um, leads to an increase in the T2 star relaxation time that we measure. And uh, with that comes an MR signal increase during activation somewhat contrary to what you might naively expect. So what you get then at the end of the day is a, is a bold response to stimulus here at the time zero is you have a fast response due to sort of the uptake of, um, of oxygen. It's like a small dip because the oxygen goes up and then you have the flow increase which washes out the deoxyhemoglobin, needs the net reduction in deoxyhemoglobin, gives you a positive signal, and then afterwards there's the sort of post stimulus industry that people are also somewhat debating as to how, what that's causing. But we, what we use in fMRI is measuring the main response here, so the positive signal increase during activation. Um, so what you have basically, um, if this is your, um, your, your echo time zero, so, so to speak, and you have a signal decay with 0% deoxyhemoglobin, like a longer T2 star would be the red curve, and if you have um, less deoxyhemoglobin, you'd have like a faster signal decay. Um, and this basically comes from the fact that within a voxel we get a spread of different frequencies if we have deoxyhemoglobin present, which will lead to a spin dephasing within that voxel um, so spins will go out of phase, which over time, so as echo time increases, leads to reduction in the net, uh, the net signal that we measure. So what you want to do is when you do fMRI, we want to measure um, at a point in time, so at an echo time, where the difference between activation and rest is greatest. And this turns out to be at the point where the echo time roughly matches your T2 star of the, of the gray matter tissue where you're, where you're measuring. Now, plotting out this difference between these two curves uh, over time, so you basically have something like this. And this maximum would, again, be at the echo time that matches the T2 star. But if you look at the images, um, if you take an image as a, at a very short echo time, it looks very nice and pretty, and you might think this is what you want to do. But in fact, if you follow this, this mechanism here that you want to acquire at an echo time where you match the T2 star, you actually get images that look pretty grotty, really. Um, so th there are some issues that I'll talk about as well. So this is not the way to do it. This may not be the way to do it either, but certainly better. Um, so just as a guide, I think a three Tesla sort of T2 star values are somewhat between 30 and 50. So typical choices of echo time would be 35 in practice. Seven Tesla, all these times are a bit shorter. It will probably require sort of an echo time of 20 or 25, depending on where in your brain you want to look. Um, so how, we, how do we do this? Well, those of you that do fMRI know that, you know, Pretty much, we use echoplanar imaging for, for most of the acquisitions in some way, shape, or form. And EPI was first proposed by Mansfield as, as early in the 80s, which was qu quite, quite some time before the bolt signal was even discovered. Right? This, he was just proposing it as a sort of a fast way of getting an image in a single shot. And in many ways, this was a bit before the time because nobody was actually doing any uh, fMRI yet. The gradient systems weren't quite up to it yet. And, and in fact, even the field strength was so low that the sort of images you would acquire in a single shot wouldn't really have a lot of uh, signal to noise. But nevertheless, this method has actually, has actually been around for quite some time. And it really became the workhouse for doing fMRI when, when the bolt signal was then sort of discovered about a decade later. Um, also finds application in diffusion, of course, and vaso and arterial spin labeling. And also the people that do body diffusion uh, are quite, quite keen on EPI because it's the single shot technique, which comes with a lot of advantages. Um, well, 
and because it's so tough on the systems, it's also been the main driver between sort of uh, gradient hardware development. Um, so the, the, main, the main sort of sequence that, that we use ha has basically been 2D equiplane imaging. So what you do is you excite a single slice, and then you read it out in a single shot, and then you get the next slice, and you kind of cover the brain like this. And as you go along, you can basically cover the brain in, at reasonable resolutions in, in well less than three seconds or so. So this is what the sequence looks like. So you have like sort of RX, RF excitation here, so the slice selective. Then basically you have the read and, and, and phase prewinders to get you down in the corner of k-space, and then you read out k-space in a single shot, typically in the, in the zigzag fashion with an alternating readout gradient. And in between, you have little blips that take you one step up along the phase encoding direction. And this, this whole thing takes about 30 to 40, 50 milliseconds. So you're done quite quickly with getting a single slice. Now this is what the k-space looks like. Nice. So you go to this corner first and have a readout one way, blip up, next line, reverse direction, and you just go through k-space like this, basically. And this thing is typically referred to as the EPI readout, and like I said, it's, it's about 40 milliseconds or so. Now, using parallel imaging techniques, you know, multiple receive call arrays, we can, we can shorten this. We can actually afford leaving out phase encoding steps, um, which, which allows us to, to skip lines and actually acquire this in a much shorter time. So if you, you know, skip every other line, we can basically read out the image in, in about half the time. And if we skip you know, two, then obviously we could, we could acquire it in about a third. And um, I'll, I'll talk about what the implications of this actually are in practice later. Now, EPI and parallel imaging has been, you know, it's, it's nice to combine them because it reduces distortions, as I'll explain later. You can also use it to, to you know, reduce the gradient switching just to make the acquisition a bit more quiet. But um, what's, what's certainly interesting at higher field is that it enables you to acquire the signal at the highest spatial resolution, right? So if you can get this space in half the time, you might even just get double the space in the same time as this, right? You can double your spatial resolution, so to speak without actually an increase in, in, in the increase of the echo train length. Now, the problem, though, is that parallel imaging has done pretty much nothing for EPI to increase the overall acquisition speed, right? So it's, it's shortened the readout, so images are less distorted and so forth, as, I, as I'll explain. But the acquisition time itself was only reduced by, say, this fraction, because for the bold signal, you need to acquire a certain echo time to give you the required sensitivity. So the overall time saving was pretty much nothing, and that's even, even worse, of course, if you consider the diffusion module, which takes, say, 60 milliseconds or so here. Um, so the overall time saving is only like a real fraction. So parallel imaging hasn't really been doing a great job in EPI. So this, this really changed about you know, five years ago when, when the slice acceleration came along. Yeah? So this has been quite a game changer, really, because then you can actually accelerate along the slice direction, and, and this would give you the nominal acceleration factor that you dial in in your protocol, right? If you do factor two, you would really get like double the data in half the time. And this, this has been quite great. Um, so there are basically two methods for this. That can, yeah, both came out about the same time. So this is, on the one hand, the multiband, which is very popular and um, being pushed very hard also by the Connecton project. And pretty much, I would say that you know, multiband acquisition has become a new standard that people have adopted in a very, very short time. And this is very good news. And, and the other way of doing slice acceleration is using a 3D kind of encoding scheme, which would give you a secondary phase encoding direction, which you um, can accelerate as well. Um, and in, in some way, the two are similar because they have the same acceleration capability, right? So in the multiband or simultaneous multi-slice, you can acquire multiple slices at once, whereas in the 3D case, you can skip phase encodes in the slice direction, um, which, which ultimately gives you the same acceleration capability. Um, now, the main difference here between the two is that the 2D multiband or SMS uh, has, is a sort of single shot technique at which you um, acquire slices in a single shot, but you get multiple at once, whereas the sort of 3D EPI scheme would mean that every additional shot you acquire would increase your spatial resolution, so to speak, right? So this is more, probably more motion sensitive. This one is, um, this one is single shot and probably less, less sensitive to physiological uh, effects. Uh, we'll probably hear about later on in this, uh, this course. Um, well, going fast pays off, and I think the first paper that really showed this in, in the context of the multiband acquisition is this one here by David Feinberg, where, where they had a you know, typical acquisition with a TR of, say, two and a half seconds, and they turned on multiband, brought the TR down to 0.8, or you push it even harder, you know, there's a combination of um, 
this, this method zero and, and multiband effect, so like a total of uh, factor nine acceleration in this case brought the TR down to 0.4 seconds. And they show that the, the detection of networks actually improved quite a lot as compared to this case. And this is a combination of being able to actually remove physiological noise contributions better because they're better resolved than the short TR, as, uh, and also the, the better statistics that you have because you have more time points available on a sort of basic level. Now, this is, this is quite an important consideration here in, in this point that you know, going faster pays off. Is, so the better resolving of physiological fluctuations that you're not interested in, so breathing and heart rate in particular, um, emotion as well, um, gives you better handle on actually re removing that later on. And there's a bunch of techniques out there, Retroico, you know, Gary Glover's method from 2000 or so is, is very popular, but then, then also things like, uh, like ICA-based approaches like the FSL fix or, um, or other ICA approaches where you manually kind of throw out the artifacts that you don't like. Um, this becomes really possible if you go at higher like risen, risen rates. Anyway, um, so with well, this multiband techniques, I mean, these things are now pretty standard, right? So this is just a, an image I pulled from the HCP website here where, where you have a sort of a TR of a second or so, and you can get one, one six millimeter isotropic resolution at three Tesla. And the, the image quality is pretty amazing. It's certainly a lot better than what regular EPI would, would have done for us about 10 years ago. So both the hardware and reconstruction have really advanced that we can actually do these things and, and not su suffer the price for actually going so fast. So these G-factor losses that you have from parallel acquisition and so forth. Um, so fair enough, so we can do these things, but how do you choose your parameters? And, and what does this mean for the management of, of artifacts at the end of the day? Because these things, they're, they're intrinsically coupled, especially in EPI, this is, this is very, very, quite coupling between these two points. So showing the image of the sequence diagram again, so we have the echo time on the one hand, which is basically the middle of your EPI readout, um, which relates most strongly to your bolt sensitivity. Um, then we have the echo train length, which is the duration over which we acquire the image. And then to some degree, there's, there's TR as well, which is more related to the sampling rate and not so much the others, but I'll talk about it a bit. Um, so the choice of echo time isn't often as easy as I made it look like. You want to pick the peak of the bolt sensitivity curve, but this often also depends on other conflicting choices. So you want a long echo time for higher resolution, so that puts a lower bound on the echo time. Um, some people want to do a shorter echo time because, um, because it actually increases your overall sampling rate. It's just like a small time saving in NTR. And if you have a signal dropout that I'll now talk about, the choice of a shorter T is also warranted most of the time, in fact, especially if you have thick slices. Um, so you see here what I mean by dropout, looking at these images. So what's, what's going on up here? Now, this comes from susceptibility gradients, so, so the field variations that we have in the brain. When you just place somebody in the magnet, then this comes from the sort of difference between the susceptibility of air, which you have you know, a lot in your, in your sort of sinuses and in your mouth, and also around the ear canals. You actually get gradients, field gradients, that act perpendicular to your slice direction which leads to signal defacing. So this is, this is a particular problem if you have so axial slice positioning here, you get the, these gradients as I've indicated with that arrow here. So the, these values are actually from seven Tesla here. So but for three Tesla you can half them, but this is still about up to 100 hertz spread in the, in the, in the field, and that'll mess up your signal. So what, what this does basically, you have, you have a slice selection process going on to define your slice, and then depending on where you place your EPI readout, if you have a long echo time, these additional field gradients that accumulate over time and generate a quite substantial moment that will mess up your slice selection. And this will be more pronounced at a long echo time than a short one. Yeah? If you have a short echo time, the integral of this red part, so the sort of local through plane gradient, will be, will be less. So the shorter your echo time, the less through plane defacing and dropout you have going on. On the other hand, you're also moving down that sensitivity curve that I was showing. So just in symbols here, it looks a bit, a bit nasty, but what, what this does basically, it's the, this defacing here, it adds a sync modulation on top of the exponential signal decay, which depends on the slice thickness of the delta Z here and the echo time. And, and this is the throughput gradient, which, which varies uh, spatially. Anyway, so reducing echo time is one thing to handle it. Reducing slice thickness is another. But um, so these are just some images here. So three Tesla images at different echo times, it's like 10, 25, 40, 40, and, and so forth. And you see that here in the sort of, um, say, visual cortex or so, um, you don't have these gradients, right? So the signal just decays very friendly with T2 star, whereas other brain areas here around the mouth, um, the signal just goes away really fast. And, and this is due to a somewhat shorter T2 star on the one hand, but mainly that through plane defacing. So what, do, what can you do? Well, you can use a shorter echo time, but it'll reduce the sensitivity everywhere else. 
you can reduce your slices, slice thickness, which will make the dropout go away, but then it will also cost you SNR because you have a smaller voxel size, right? And as we know, SNR scales with the voxel volume. Um, and if you have many thin slices, also it will make your TR longer if you still want to cover the same volume, right? So you're kind of, you're kind of stuck and have to find some compromise between those. Now, people have come up with all sorts of things. Um, one being using a variable echo time, so yeah, so why not use a, long, a shorter echo time at the bottom of the brain and a higher one up here? But in most cases, that's also somewhat impractical. Um, so this was done at one and a half Tesla, at three Tesla and up, you don't really have that luxury of shifting the echo time around so much. Um, there's also the idea floating around of uh, actually using thinner slices at the bottom and thicker slices on the top. It's also, also a nice idea, but the, the, these, you know, they, they come with problems in the subsequent analysis. Um, alternative, certainly easier way of going is um, acquiring a sort of multi-echo. So rather than just acquiring one image with a standard readout, you would use uh, your parallel imaging to shorten each readout and then get multiple, and then you acquire multiple images in the single shot at different echo times. And you can then combine them afterwards. Yeah? So depending on whether a brain area has a lot of through plane dephasing going on or not, you can put more weight on, on the shorter echo times if the signal goes away quicker. And, and you do like a weighting that more follows the bold sensitivity curve um, for, the, for the pixels where um, the decay isn't that fast. And this actually works very well, and, and, and many people actually, I actually use this technique. And I'm not going to talk about um, what, what else you can do with it, but it's basically you can also use this for automatic denoising, you know, separating of bold effects from physiological um, effect like fluctuations that are actually happening at echo time zero. So in particular, the work at Pante Kundu, I, I should mention here. Uh, moving on from this, what else can you do about dropout? Um, since we basically have a local gradient that messes up our slice selection, we can, in principle, just play out in the sequence uh, in a compensatory gradient that tries to make up for it. Now, the problem is that this dephasing effect is a local effect, right? so it only affects certain brain areas. And if we throw in a compensation gradient into the sequence that has a, that has a, um, a, a global compensation effect, and this is not exactly what we want necessarily, right? So if we have a normal acquisition here with a bit of dropout here, we can put on a compensation gradient to get this area back, but then everything else is defaced. So that, that Z-shaming is, is all a very nice idea, and, but you have to use it very carefully and, and if, you, if you don't end up, don't want to end up acquiring two images that you then have to combine afterwards, right? So Martina Callahan on the, on the Saturday session, for instance, introduced that they use a Z-shim, so where you have to optimize slice orientation, a bit of a Z-shim, um, that gives you a good compromise in which you have a reasonable sensitivity on average. But uh, the classic way of doing Z-shaming would be where you have uh, multiple acquisitions with different Z-shim increments, and then you combine the image together, and you can end up with a very nice one here. So this is some three Tesla data. Um, the very least thing I think you should do, in general, anyone should do about um, dropout is to choose your slice orientation somewhat wisely. I mean, this, this again is data from seven Tesla, so it's, it's a more pronounced effect here. And what these panels show here is the, the effect on the image and dropout that you get for different slice orientations. So if you just zoom into this one, um, you see if we have sort of a downward slice orientation, it really eats into your frontal, frontal brain. So this is, this is really quite nasty. You lose basically all the, all the frontal, all the frontal um, parts of the brain here, inferior frontal. Um, so this is like a standard axial, it's not too bad. But it actually turns out that, that this one here, or maybe this one, they have the, you know, the, best, um, the, the best preserving of the, the frontal brain areas. And this is because changing a slice orientation basically manages what component of the through plane gradient actually goes, well, well so the, what component of the susceptibility gradient goes through your slice or acts along the phase encoding direction. So you can really manage this. But the big but here, and what you don't see in these images here, because they're in-plane distortion corrected, is you don't see what this does to the distortion, right? So if you have a susceptibility gradient, you shift it out from the, from the through plane into the in-plane direction, it'll, it'll give you distortion. Um, so there's, there's no way out. You've got to choose one of the two. And to what extent you can really correct for distortion, um, that's also debatable, because distortion always gives you loss in effective spatial resolution as well. Um, now, so why, why does this distortion actually happen? Um, so moving on to what the, the in-plane effect from the through plane effect, is basically that we, in our spatial encoding that we do in MRI, we basically assume that the, the gradients that we play out with the scanner are the only gradients present. And in our Fourier reconstruction, we assume that, that, that this is the truth, basically. So if you have any other additional gradients present, be it from the susceptibility or from, a, from coming from the sample in some way, or bad shim, or whatnot, that'll result in a mislocalization because we have a wrong assumption about the field gradients present actually are. 
And, and this primarily happens along the phase encoding direction in EDPR. We normally assume it's only along the phase encoding direction because this is the direction with the, with the low acquisition bandwidth. Now, so if, if this was an object here and we try to basically reconstruct it on the basis of having you know, different frequencies in all the different places and so forth in our Fourier reconstruction, but there happens to be one voxel that behaves the same way as one voxel up here, we would m mislocalize the signal that's originating from, from this position here and think it's coming from here. So we'd have a signal pile up up here and a signal stretching that's, that's down here. Um, so if you want to put some symbols to it, um, it's basically all due to sort of the, the, the delta in B0 um, from the susceptibility uh, difference um, of, say, air and, and the tissue up here. And the B0 obviously scales with the main field, so at higher field you have more distortion. And, and this phase accrual also scales with the effective echo spacing, which is the, um, the amount of time it takes to get from one case baseline to the next. Um, one other point to note is the echo spacing, so whether we sample up or down, in case space will actually affect the, the direction of our distortion as well. So if you we encode our signal going up in one way, we might have a signal pile up. And if we turn around the phase encoding direction, we have a signal stretching in the same areas. And these are equal and opposite effects. And that's actually quite nice because it gives us a handle on correcting distortion. So this is, for instance, what the, the top-up method uses. Anyway, so for some reason, the vendors have decided to do this, which is a bit unfortunate. It looks nicer, but it's a pile up. So effectively, you cannot resolve any where, where signal is coming from because it's all pushed together, right? So you, you might have a there might be up to like a centimeter, two centimeters even, of, of signal that's compressed into one bright voxel, and resolving that spatially is is a bit of a problem. Now parallel imaging increases our effective sampling bandwidth, so it reduces the distortion. If you go twice as much, twice as fast, we have a factor less, factor two less distortion, for instance, or factor three acceleration, factor three less distortion, and so forth. So this is this is quite a good effect of parallel imaging by itself. Um, sorry, this should be partial Fourier. So just to, just to clean up this myth, um, people say if you reduce your echo train length, it will give you less distortion. This is, well, this is true in the context of using parallel imaging, but it's not true when it comes to partial Fourier. If you dial in, say, 6-8 partial Fourier, and say, okay, now my readout is only three quarters as long, it, this, it has no effect on distortion at all. In fact, it will give you extra blurring because the partial Fourier reconstruction doesn't work so well for t to star weighted things. Now, T to star blurring, mentioning it, um, so the low, the long echo time, so the low bandwidth, so, sorry, the long echo train length, so the low bandwidth in the phase encoding direction uh, gives you T to star blurring as well, and this is an effect that's additional to the, to the distortion, and this comes from the fact that we're having a, uh, basically, um, a full transform of the T to star decay that defines our point spread, and the longer the readout is, the more, the more blurring we get, and we are not gonna get the effective resolution that we, that we want. Um, so for distortion correction, um, there's a bunch of methods out there, we, we can't really go into them, but they're all based on the idea of generating a shift map um, and then applying it to, to put the signal back to where it belongs. And you can either measure, measure that directly with a field map or like, a, like an explicit point spread function mapping, or you can extract the shifts from, from a pair of uh, reverse phase encoded images like, a, like you indicated on the previous slide. Um, so other parameter choices here, repetition time, well, so obviously this, this relates to the volume coverage, um, and it de depends on slice thickness and the slice gaps and so forth. But TR is not about going fast. It's not only about going fast, it's also about the available magnetization as well. And so, so basically it depends on, so this available magnetization here depends on how often we excite, so how long our TRs, but also what, um, so, so when, we, when we hit more often basically a certain flip angle, the available steady state magnetization is lower, but also in how hard. So basically, if we, if, we, if we don't use a flip angle that's 90 necessarily, that brings up, down our magnetization all the way here to the transverse plane. Um, so in, anyway, I should probably speed up. No, should I leave question time? Yeah. So, so you have to find the right compromise between the choice of flip angle and the TR as well. And this, because you want to maximize the magnetization that you have to play with. And this is, this is given by the, by the Ernst angle, which is also very easy to calculate, and you should probably do that. Depending on TR and some assumption of what your T1 is in the, in the gray matter tissue, you should go for an optimal flip angle here. Um, it's not too critical, though, certainly not a three Tesla. We typically acquire in a regime that is physiological dominated. And this was quite nicely shown by some work from the NIH group here. So they, they looked at the typical sort of three Tesla acquisition that tried different flip angles here. So the theoretically expected um, 
sensitivity would be this, but in reality, in the actual bolt data, it was really flat, and they reduced all the way down to sort of an eight-degree flip angle, and didn't really get much, much compromise in the sensitivity. Now, this entirely changes when you move to a regime where you are image noise dominated, then every little bit of SNR really counts. So this is the, the case when you go to high-resolution acquisitions, like one and a half millimeters and below, um, say. Certainly, at high field, it becomes a consideration. Um, so just, just, to, just finally, what about motion? Well, motion is bad, obviously. Um, motion corrupts our data, it blurs our data, and certainly in spin echo, uh, in 2D EPI, we get um, spin history effects. And this comes from the fact that if we consider having our slices oriented like this, in a sort of a, just an axial fashion, say, and there's no motion going on, then every slice will experience the same TR all the time. But now if there's motion between subsequent volumes, the TR experienced by, 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 by some spins will effectively change. It'll change more on the outside of the brain than the inside of the brain. And, and then we get signal fluctuations that are, that are more pronounced on the outside here than, than, than in the middle. So this is a bit of an issue, because especially if this correlates with your task or whatever you get your subject to do, you, you, have, you have a count of confound that's, that's not so easy to deal with. Um, just as a note, since this is like a volume to volume change, I, I think this effect is best captured in the sort of first derivative of your total, total motion plot and not so much of the, you know, of the motion plot itself. So it's like the, the difference in position from one, from one scan to the next that you should actually put into your GLM to try to get account for this fact, effect. Now this is, this is quite a strong effect in 2D EPI, sort of single shot acquisitions. It's probably less of an issue in 3D because you're exciting the same volume all the time, but then you get a blurring instead, which is also not so nice because it's very, very difficult to get rid of as well. Um, just, just, just finally now, so it's not just the spin history that gives you a problem in motion, but also the position of the brain in the magnetic field will give you different um, B0 effectively. So the distortion effect will depend on how your brain is oriented in the brain, uh, in the field. Um, so the, the post-dependent distortion, so to speak. And this is quite nicely seen here in this, in this little animation here where, where there's some head nodding going on. This is spin acquisition, so there's no dropout. But you can really see how the distortion in the, in the frontal brain changes depending on how the, how the brain is oriented. And this gets really tricky to correct. You certainly can't do that on the basis of a single phase map that you acquire at the start of the scan. Yeah, so this is another way of showing it. So you have the distortion always acting on the phase encoding direction. So you rotate your head, the stretching would be in the other way. Um, and, and you can see also that a simple motion correction wouldn't take care of it because the brain shape is really distorted. Now, this is obviously an aggressive example here, but you basically see what, the, what, what, what this means. So just to summarize, um, so EPI is the by far dominant sequence for fMRI, the different versions of the 2D EPI, the now multiband EPI, which is probably the, the new standard in many ways. So on the Siemens platforms, 3D EPI, more popular for the high resolution and high field stuff. And fMRI with EPI can give you excellent sensitivity to the microscopic field perturbation that you're after when you measure a bolt. But the, the bad thing is it's also very sensitive to sort of the microscopic P0 effects. So in particular, the dropout distortion, blurring, and so forth. And you need to control for those by, you know, by careful parameter choices and making trade-offs. Yeah, there's no free lunch, unfortunately, in MR. It's, it's still not changed, and we'll never have that. So you always have to find some sort of trade-off that works best for you. And with this, thank you.